gives the, the seeing a degrade. Too bad. All right, folks, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you all. Uh, for those of you who are in Zoom, please do um, say hi if you'd like, as per tradition. If you're new here, that's sort of what we do as we all say hi to each other and where we're from uh, in there. And if you'd like to also share what your weather is like, that would be great too. Uh, I'm Jenna, it's cloudy. Um, and, and Chris, it's cloudy where Chris is too. Um, we will be uh, talking about galaxies today. We're gonna to be talking about galaxies that are easy to find, um, which is great because I find finding anything a challenge. So if anything helps here, and Chris, Chris actually wrote an article about this in Sky News, I'll grab the link to it um, about, or it, it should be in this issue, right? It's in the issue that just got sent out. Yeah, yeah. So are we started? Are we, are we, are we going? Yeah, we're set. We're, we're live on YouTube, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this, this, the, the impetus for today's session is this article that I, in the latest Sky News issue, it's um, hiding in plain sight. So it's, it's objects that you can find. With, um, with a manual telescope, you don't need to have a fancy computerized telescope, which is what you often do need, um, you know, to, to find some of these deep sky objects. But if you know where they're lurking, then you can sometimes just find them by navigating to something that's brighter and easier to see. And that's the kind of the idea behind this today. Um, the, the, the philosophy behind those articles in Sky News is that I often hear when I'm out at a local observing location in the dark. I hear somebody talking in the distance at their scope and they'll be, you know, what should I look at next? And I find that a lot of people get stuck on the Messier objects, whereas the Messier objects cover 110 or so deep sky objects out of 15,000 or something like that that are cataloged. Mm -hmm. And albeit a lot of those are beyond the reach of amateurs, but there are definitely lots and lots of other objects that are available to people. And um, one of the things I often mentioned in the articles, sorry, I put the magazine over here, that's why I'm glancing over there, is, uh, is, the, is the RASC's finest NGC list, which was um, compiled by Alan Dyer, our, our friend Alan Dyer. And it's, um, it's modeled after the Messi. So the Messi uh, have 110 objects in, the, in that list from a variety of categories of deep sky. And Alan thought, well, here's another 110 that are, that are equally fine to see spread out throughout the year. And there's another set of objects that are, there's some overlap, um, but so none of Alan's objects are Messier's. So when you finish the Messier's, you can move on to the finest NGC, and then those will be completely new to you. And there are a lot of them that are, that are quite bright and easy to see. And then there is a set of objects called the Caldwell objects as well that would be another 110 and they were they were pr produced or prepared by the astronomer Patrick Moore from England um, who's since passed but um, his last name is M2 so he didn't call them M objects he used his mother's name I think his mate his mother's name was Caldwell so he calls them the Caldwell objects but that's for another day so yeah so so today I'm going to run down um, some things you can do with your with your manual telescope. And if you've got a go-to telescope, you're fine too. I mean, I'm hoping that you get some ideas for new things to look at with your telescope, regardless of, of what it is. So what I can do is I'm gonna grab my Stellarium here and open it up. And do some While you pull it up, I'll just mention that I shared um, RASC's finest NGC observing program in the chat. Um, if you have not done it already, it's um, our observing programs are uh, meant to sort of guide you through some of the objects in space and you can get a certificate and a pin if you are a RASC member for most of them or for all of them um, by completing them and seeing all the right stuff. So the link for that is in the chat. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start tonight, even though the focus of the magazine article is, is the summertime, more the summertime sky, more this late this month, next month, May, June. Um, I'll start tonight because I want to just begin with some things that people can look for when they go out tonight. And as you've no doubt learned by watching some of our prior sessions, this area in the, this, so this is the, the southern sky at 10 p.m. Um, at mid-northern latitude. So this is for Toronto area, but if you're anywhere across Canada, this would be about the scenario you'd see at about 10 p.m. local time. 
in your time zone, you're going to find the constellation of Leo just a little bit to the to the west of south, and then you're going to find uh, Virgo. And then above that, you've got Coma Berenices, Canis Venetici, the hunting dogs, and then way at the top at the zenith, you've got the Big Dipper and Ursa Major region. And um, the first thing that we recommend that people who just want to see galaxies with their telescope, um, assuming you've got a relatively dark sky, we've got a new moon today, so this is a good time to look. Um, I'll just indicate that the new moon periods, the moonless nights over the next few months include, let's see if I can find that list, yeah. So uh, May 3rd to 13th, so ending a couple of days from now. Um, and then June 2nd to 12th would be the next round of uh, moonless, moonless weeks. And that's meant to cover from third quarter to a couple of days after new moon when the moon is, it's up in the, it's up after sunset, but it, it goes to bed early. So it doesn't really bother us. So the first trick is to, is to grab the, all the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, which are sitting here between the tail of Leo and the upper arm of Virgo, of, of, the Vir of, of Virgo the Maiden. And the trick that I use is I just take my, my finder scope and I just aim my telescope exactly halfway between the bright star Vindia Matrix and De Nebula and just zoom in and maybe, you know, go a little bit, maybe a little bit closer to Vindia Matrix than De Nebula, but basically midway and you're gonna likely gonna see fuzzy patches like that showing up. And what you've found here is some of the big showpieces of the spring sky. You've got Messier 86, oh, wow. Messier 84, and then arcing up to the left here, which will be flipped in your telescope. So if you've got a, um, a refractor or an SCT, schmidt cassegrain telescope, it's probably gonna be mirrored left, right. So it'll be flipped that way. And if you have a Newtonian, Dobsonian reflector or a Newtonian reflector, it'll flip in both senses. But what you wanna do is look for the, I'm just gonna take the symbols off so you get the sense of it. You wanna look for the, the bright patch of, of brightness in the sky and that can be your anchor point. Now you may end up at one of the other bright ones. There's another one down here. This is Messier 87. And you can see once I reveal all the deep sky objects in Stellarium, there's, there are thousands of galaxies in this uh, Virgo cluster region, but they're really dominated by some of these, um, these objects. In fact, speaking of Messier objects, so if we just go into the deep sky objects menu in Stellarium and we switch off the NGCs and just leave the Messiers, then what you'll find is there are about, I think, 16 or 17 Messier objects in that patch of the sky. And again, they're dominated by some of these big ellipticals, and then you can hunt around and pick up some of the other objects around it. So the trick, the trick just to re recapitulate or, or reiterate is what I recommend is, is take your telescope, pick a moonless night, grab your lowest power eyepiece, the one with the largest focal length, the biggest number on it, Put that in your telescope and then focus your telescope on either one of the two stars, De Nebula or Vinia Matrix. So get your telescope nicely focused, crisp, and then without changing the focus, then you wanna swing it and aim it between the two stars. And then you can start exploring and you'll find lots and lots of the galaxies there. So um, yeah, so that's, that's a great way to pick up a whole bunch of, of Messiers if you're doing your Messier certificate or just explore and enjoy the spring galaxies. So that's trick number one. The second trick is to, is to look higher up. Now, the, the visibility or the, appear, the quality of the view of an object is best when it's highest in the sky, because then you're reviewing it through the least amount of Earth's atmosphere. So we, we don't really have much say in the matter from, from, you know, from Canada. Um, the Virgo cluster is, you know, it's a bit about halfway up the sky. It doesn't get any higher than that. But Thankfully, there are a whole bunch of galaxies up here in Ursa Major that we can take advantage of, and they're right near the zenith, so that's prime, uh, prime viewing location. And my, my favorite tricks for this are, there's a couple of them. So one, this is gonna swing around upside down in a minute, but that's okay. 
So take, find the Big Dipper, take the star Fecta, which is the lower star on the inner corner of the Dipper bowl, draw an imaginary line to Doobie, the outer lip of the bowl, and then just double that and keep going. And if you do that, this is gonna swing around, that's okay. Put it upside down. Just aim your telescope there. I'm just gonna bring up the, my, my finder scope here. So take these two, one to the other and about double it. And you should find these guys. Ooh. So this is Messier 81. It's actually um, nicknamed Bode's, Bode's Nebula is actually the more common name. Mm -hmm. That's because astronomers used to think that those were nebulas and not galaxies before they had better optics. So it's called Bode's, Bode's Nebula or Bode's Galaxy. That's Messi 81. And almost in the same field of view, if you're using a low power eyepiece, is you can look for its partner, Messi 82, or the Cigar Galaxy. Let me just bring up the symbols here so you can have them both. And this, this um, cigar galaxy is actually, um, it's smaller, but it's actually more compact. The, it, the, the, the starlight is um, uh, localized better. It's, it's, it's concentrated into a smaller patch of the sky. So it's actually visibly maybe a little bit brighter in your telescope than the more face on M81. But um, this is what's called a peculiar galaxy. It's got a you won't see too clearly the extra detail in your own telescope, but it's got these jets and, and weird uh, things going on in the middle of around the core of the galaxy. So that's the Cigar M81, M82, or Bodes and Cigar Galaxy. So that's the trick using just the dipper. You can eyeball this. I do this all the time. So if you get if you're relatively practiced at it, just make that imaginary line, bump, bump, double it, and you're pretty much there. So that's a pretty easy one to do. The other one you can do is go around to the tip of the handle of the dipper, zoom in on that. And you wanna measure off, uh, let's see, I'll get a binoculars field of view here. So you can just bring up a circle that represents binoculars, about six and a half degrees or so. So if you put your binoculars and if you've got a dark sky, Within a binocular field of view, you can see this little fuzzy patch, and that's M101, the pinwheel galaxy. So it's sitting there just about five degrees off the, uh, off the tip of the Big Dipper. And then if you go the other direction, not, not quite a straight line across, but more or less at the other direction, even a little bit closer to the star alcade, you can pick up. M51, that's the, oops, go back here a bit. There we go, the Whirlpool. And when you're looking at the Whirlpool, see if that's you can see the cool second one. patch. Sorry, Jen. I've never, I've never looked at it in a telescope before, but I've always wanted to see if I could see that. Cause it's like, is it two galaxies that are merging or is it just an odd shape? Um, it seems to be it seems to be a situation with a primary galaxy and some kind of a secondary galaxy that's been captured or something going on. There's mm. a there's a bridge of stars that kind so of run cool. between them. Um, I have seen both of those with binoculars from the Carr Observatory, so near Thornbury, Ontario, on a moonless night. So they're they're quite prominent, really. You just need to find the, the Big Dipper's the tip of the handle and you can pick up. It's here and here. So, so like, a right, like a right angle triangle between. Yeah, Mizar the other trick is to, use, is to use Mizar and Alcor and make a isosceles triangle. That works too. Hmm. Yeah. And so once you've, and then the um, M51 is the right angle triangle above, yeah. So that, those are great tips, thanks. All right, so there's a couple there. And again, those are Messier's, but that's fine. Who's counting? Um, now go back to Leo. And what you can do is you can use, um, you've got De Nebula. We already, you know, you've learned De Nebula because you need to know that for the Virgo cluster. Then you can find Regulus, which is the bright, brightest star in Leo. 
And then between them and a little higher, you've got the star Churton. And Churton is your guide to the Leo triplet of galaxies. And so you can see here, this distance is about two finger widths or two degrees. And if you, if you have a, this is a, this, these red circles are what's called a Telrad um, finder scope where it puts the concentric rings, but you don't, doesn't matter if you don't have a Telrad. If you can estimate, you know, roughly, what would that be, about a quarter or a third of the distance between these two, two stars, but come down and just aim your telescope with a nice wide field of view and look for these three galaxies called the Leo triplet. Two of them are Messier galaxies. And the third one is the Hamburger galaxy. And it's not labeled because in my Stellarium, I switched off the, the non Messiers. I'll just put that back on. There we go. So this is the Hamburger galaxy. It's another one of these um, ARP peculiar galaxies because of its unusual shape. See, it looks like, it almost looks like a rectangle. So it's kind of like the meat inside a bun. That's why they call it. It's very boxy. Yeah, and if you've got a good, if you have good, uh, good, a good sky, dark sky, and good transparency, you should be able to make out some hint of its shape, and you might be able to see the dark lane that divides the the core in, in, in two, into two halves, the north and south half. So that's the Leo triplet. So that's relatively easy for you know for beginners to find those just using these bright stars. And then the another set, so if you go about halfway between Churton and Regulus, and again, just a couple of degrees below the line joining them, then you can find more galaxies. There's a bunch here. I'll just put the labels on. So you've got M96 and M95, and you've got Messier 105. So three Messier galaxies, and then above the, the Messier 105, you've got a couple of other NGC galaxies. So, so those are some ways you can use LEO to get yourself um, in the neighborhood. Now, these aren't using my, um, our advertised uh, idea about, about galaxies beside bright stars. We'll get to that in a second. But these are some really um, great tips for finding these easily for you. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, another one I mentioned in my notes. Go back up to, to the star Fecta and, and zoom in on it. And then you can look for Messi 109, just sitting, let me just measure it off here. So that's uh, 38 arc minutes. So that's about the full moon's diameter, a little bit more than the moon's diameter apart from, from Fecta. And so to see, if you face north, let's turn this off. If you face north and use Fecta that way, then, then M109 will be to the upper right of the galaxy. So, so basically, if you, if you think of where, where's Merak, come along the base of the Dipper's Bowl and keep going a little bit, that's where, Fecta, that's where M109 is. And that's like less than the distance of your pinky held at arm's length away yeah. from Fecta. And, and this would be, these two would be um, together in the field of view of, um, of a low power eyepiece. So within about a degree. Uh, let's see, I think I had one more. Oh yeah, going back down to, I'm gonna face, I'm gonna face south again here. So we've got, we're back to Leo and Virgo. And then we've got this L-shaped Coma Berenices constellation. And the, 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 if you think of the, the plane of our galaxy as a disc, and then the, that disc will have an axis at right angles to the plane, that, that, that right angle axis is actually points to a spot in the constellation of Coma Berenices. It's the North Galactic Pole. And that's why there's so many galaxies available to us in that part of the sky is because it's the farthest away you can get from the all the, the traffic, the dust and gas in our own galaxy. So we're kind of seeing a clear window out into the universe. So this is so, like if you put your head in the center of an inner tube and the inner tube is the Milky Way and that is up. Yeah? Yeah. Be okay. up, from, up with respect to the plane of our, of our galaxy. That's right. 
So then, yeah, so if you go down to the, you can find the L and it's the star that's kind of, here's Arcturus, really bright Arcturus. You want it, you can sort of go between from Arcturus towards Denebola and see if you can find these, these three stars in Coma are not bright, bright, but they're okay. You'll see them from a, you know, a reasonably dark night. Um, that star is called Diadem. And if you, again, if you point your telescope at Diadem, you can pick up these globular clusters um, probably in the same field of view of your telescope eyepiece, or maybe, maybe just beyond it. All right, so that brings us to kind of how to navigate or think about um, how to describe where things are um, on the clock with respect to other objects. So, so what we're gonna do is spend the rest of our time by me giving you some bright stars to point at and then where compared to those stars will you look to see the galaxies near them. Now, I can't use up, down, left and right because it'll depend on a whole bunch of factors. So from say, early evening when they rise in the east to the time they set in the west, the angle of all the constellations flips around by almost 180 degrees. And so if I tell you that something's to the left, that may be true just after it's risen, but it won't be true by the time it's getting ready to set hours later. So the sky, because of the rotation through the night, messes up you know, those instantaneous directions of, of up, down, left, and right. So what, what people tend to use are the celestial coordinates. And the celestial coordinates can be a little bit tricky for beginners to wrap their head around. Um, there are aspects that are easy and aspects that are hard, but um, basically the, I'm just gonna declutter my screen a little bit. I'm gonna bring up. So if I bring up the, the azimuth grid, then you know, up down would be the vertical line up from the horizon in azimuth. And then east and west would be running parallel to the horizon, but turning left and right. But the sky doesn't move that way. The sky actually moves in arcs, rising in the east and setting in the west. So we have these equatorial grids. And these equatorial grids are basically anchored at the north and south celestial poles. So here's Polaris. So there's the, the anchor point for the equatorial grid. And you can see if I face south, then the line running up and down through Polaris and down to my southern horizon would be north and south declination. But if I turned and faced east, those lines go on, become slanted. So now north is to the upper left, right? Instead of being up down. And if I turn and face west, then it flips around the other way. Now north is to my upper right. So, so things move around um, depending on the direction you're facing. But as far as, as, far as the, um, the angle away from a star, if I say it's northwest of a certain star, it'll always be, northwest would be north is up and west is this way, so it'd be always this way, regardless of where that star ends up in the sky. But the trick then is to know where are northeast, south, and west in the eyepiece, and that can get tricky. Mm -hmm. So let me just see if I can demonstrate that for you here. I almost always get lost when I'm using my telescope. I don't know what it is. I swear I'm good at some things, but I'm not good at figuring out, my brain is not good at seeing the pattern of what happens when my telescope flips the view. Like I just, I just have such a mental block there. All right, so let me see if I can demystify this a little bit. I do go over, I do go over this a little bit in the magazine, but so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my, um, my circle here to match an eyepiece size circle. So I'm just gonna change this to, let's call this one degree. While Chris does that, everybody subscribe to Sky News. If you're a RASC member, you already get it. So if you're not a RASC member, it comes with your membership. It's a good time. All right. So uh, let's see, this one doesn't have a, it doesn't matter if we have a galaxy or not. So if I wanted to guide you to look at the star, you know, beta 603, I could tell you that, well, it's below the nebula in your eyepiece. But that's only true on May 11th at 10 p.m. If I centered the nebula and I 
change this a few hours later, then that star is no longer where it was. Now it's rotated around because of the way the sky has changed through the night. If I go into Stellarium here and I switch this to equatorial mode, which is not the natural way we see the sky, it locks those in place. And no matter which way I change the time, that map always stays fixed for me. Now, if you wanna know, if I tell you that the star is, I happen to know that this star is say south southwest of Denebola. So in this view, north is up. Remember things rise on to the, to, towards the left and the east and they set towards the right in the west and south is the bottom. So in this view right now, we've got north here, west, south and east. So even though the east and west are flipped in the sky for what we're used to thinking about in terms of walking around on the earth, the best way to remember it is to think about you're looking at a map, you're holding the map in your hand. And when you look at a map, if you put north up, then you've got your, you know, your, your, sorry, I have that wrong? Yeah, I have that wrong. Sorry. Yeah, it's opposite to what you think of in a map. So east is, yeah. east is to the left, west is to the right. And it's in this case, it's because with a map, you're looking down at it. And in yeah. this case, you're looking up at it. So it'd be like turning the map, pointing the map at the sky and then looking at it. And then so, it would be correct. It's very, it's confusing that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so let's, let's see how this works. So the best way to find out your directions when you're using your telescope is to use a technique that lets the objects drift. So if you've got a manual telescope, they'll drift. If you center an object and let go of it, the Earth's rotation will carry them out of your field of view and they'll always drift west. So if I let time start running here, I'll just zoom in a little bit here. And I can turn off, yeah, I have to uncenter it. There you go, yeah, you're, yeah, you're centered on the object. Huh. And you can, you can teach this to yourself by experimenting with Stellarium. The trick is to, um, if you lock, if you select the object, it'll stop really drifting. But if you unselect it, then it'll be released to drift. So hmm. I can tell that right now, west is to the right of this view. If I go back and I pick an object that's say coming up in the sky, let's say I pick Vega. I put Vega in my field of view. I don't know if you can tell, but Vega is slowly drifting this direction because it's rising. So it's so in this case, east is below you, is below where Vega is coming from, and west is where it's mm. heading to. And then if I pick something way over in the western half of the sky, I can pick, say, Pollux, for example. You can see it's dropping downwards. Hmm. So no matter what, what patch of the sky you're working in, just center the object, center any object if you want to, and just see which direction it drifts towards and make a mental note. And that's, that's the west. And then of course, east is opposite that. And then you've got north and south, which will be at right angles to that direction. But which is which? That's where it can get tricky. Now, one thing you could do is you could say, well, I know west is here and east is here. So is this going to be north or is this going to be north? So what you could do is lift your head up and say, oh yeah, well, where's Polaris? Polaris is off to the right here. So that means that north is this way. So that's one way you could do it. The other way you could do it is, um, is learn, learn how your telescope handles the flip. So the northeast, south and west positions on the circle will vary according to your telescope's optics. But the good news is that your telescope will always be the same. So the way it works here is, let me just bring up a field of view here. I'll just bring you up a picture. So if I show you a regular view, so here's an example where um, I've, I've got a star, bright star, um, Mu Ursa, Maj Ursa Majoris, and a galaxy near sitting nearby. 
Here's a one degree field of view, typical for your telescope. And then west is to the right. And I figured out, and we know that north is up. So if we're standing outside, we know west is off to our right and north is higher. So that's, that's a regular, this is a binoculars field of view, binoculars point of view. If you have a Newtonian reflecting telescope, just open this up. So it basically yeah. takes that view and rotates it 180 degrees. So it took, it moved the west from this side over to this side and it moved the north from top to bottom. So that's why you can, if you're using a star atlas with your Newtonian telescope, you can navigate the sky with your unaided eyes. And then when you're looking in the eyepiece, you can just turn your, your, your atlas upside down and it'll match yeah. what you're seeing in the eyepiece. And the third one is if you've got a refractor telescope with a star diagonal or a Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope with a star diagonal, it's a little trickier. What it does is it takes the original view, which is this one, binoculars view, and it, and it keeps north up, but it mirror images it. Right. Okay. And you can practice this by using the moon. So you can look at the moon and then compare how the moon looks in your telescope and say, oh yeah, my telescope mirror images it and just note that. And it'll always be that, that case for you. So I had the, we had this conversation in last week's Moon at Noon because yet again, I'm not good at this. Um, I had trouble because I was tilting my head, which I didn't take into account. And so then I found that it was rotated more than I was expecting it to be rotated. And then I got very confused and thought I was a special case and that my telescope was, you know, magic. And I just didn't know how to work with it. Um, yeah. And yeah. So it turns you, out you, I was my you've, fault. You've hit on the, 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 the kind of the flaw or the tricky part to this whole point. <laughs> I'm showing you the perfect scenario where North is straight up and so on. Um, but yeah depending on how you're standing and looking at your telescope um, and depending on which patch of the sky you're looking at, west will not be to the left or the right. It'll be, as I showed a couple of minutes ago, it might be at the bottom, it might be at the top. But the, the thing is you can watch how things drift. You can always find where west, which side, which, which point on the circle west is by letting it drift. Okay, you got that. Then here's, here's you, wanna wrote, you wanna write this down. If you have a reflector telescope, okay, north is 90 degrees counterclockwise from west. Huh, okay. All right, here's the west, 90 degrees counterclockwise. And that will always So be north will be, so if, even if west is, is here, go counterclockwise 90 degrees and north will be there. Just remember that you can even write it on a post-it, put it on your telescope. <laughs> if you have, if you have a, if you have a, um, a refractor telescope with a diagonal or an SET, okay, north is 90 degrees clockwise from west. <laughs> so here's the SET, 90 degrees clockwise. Those are the only things you need to remember. So let it drift to find west and then use those two rules to figure where everything else is. Yeah. <laughs> is that okay? okay while, we, oh. while we take, yeah, while we take a pause, I'm never, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get it. I, I will keep trying. Um, just a quick pause. Joanna asked um, that, or mentioned that her C, uh, SCT turns things upside down with the star diagonal. Does that make sense? I think it's, you're probably having a similar situation to me, which is that it's turning things, it's flipping things horizontally, but then your head is in a position where it seems that it's upside down, which is exactly what I did. Yes. Um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't flip things upside down. No, it, if you're standing behind the OTA, looking down to the star diagonal, it should only mirror it. Mm -hmm. But if then, you have an equatorial mount, you could be standing and looking into the eyepiece from any angle, right? And so for that, you just need to use the drift trick to find West. And then my, but my rule still works, the counterclockwise versus clockwise. Okay. So just figure um, out where West is, and then you can use the, um, Use the other trick, use the other tool. Okay. Two other things, two other things, yeah. sorry, I'll be quick, um, Chris. Uh, so there were a couple of questions asked about stuff that we've covered before. And so I answered them with typing 
um, and the links to the various past shows of ours or to Stellarium are under the answered uh, section of the Q&A if you want to go and check them out there. Um, and now as we get into targets um, that we're actually looking at and using these like little star hopping tricks, um, we've had a couple people mention uh, that they're in cities and it's harder to observe galaxies in cities because of the light pollution. A hundred percent, I feel you. Um, Chris, and we may, we may want to do eventually a session on city targets um, or uh, things that you can see by traveling just outside of the city. For now, Chris, can you, are you able to mention whether or not these targets that we're going through are visible from the city? Um, I have a pretty healthy sized telescope, but I can see, um, I can see M81 and M82 from the end of my driveway with a street light nearby from the suburbs. So you could definitely, I would definitely give those a try up near the dipper. Uh, the Whirlpool pinwheel might be a little harder. Um, of course, Andromeda Galaxy just goes without saying that you can see that. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be in the countryside in the country to see that. Um, I can, globular sort of clusters are great for being, for seeing in the city as well, because mm -hmm. they tend to come through. Uh, a lot of open clusters and globular clusters are good. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll definitely do a session for um, city observing. Mm -hmm. That's a good suggestion. The, the messy the objects do tend to be a little brighter than the finest NGC in general. Yeah, and that helps too. Um, Mike Ashby has one question specifically about the Whirlpool Galaxy. Do you think the Whirlpool Galaxy would be visible in the city? Um, it, well, you have, if you have a big telescope, um, I can't remember if I've seen it. it it's not going to, you're not going to see it clearly, but you'll see yeah. a brightening patch, perhaps. If you have an eight inch or 10 inch telescope or, or bigger, um, mm -hmm. you can get yourself, you know, hide yourself somewhere where you're not really getting light, you know, white light in your eyes, uh, shroud the you know, hide the local lights and things like that. You might be able to do it or go to the, go to a local park. If you can take your telescope yeah, to a local helpful. park where there's not street lights and things around you, you should be able to pick up some of these, yeah. Someday we'll do a whole episode dedicated just to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and I, you know, I, I will admit right off the back, a bat here that um, the objects that I'm going to cover for the rest of the session, some of them will, t will be challenging unless you live under good skies. But I wanted to give people kind of a variety. Some people, some of our viewers have great skies and I just wanted to give them some other suggestions to look at. Other of us are kind of limited to the brighter objects. Okay, now if you're hunting around for things to look at in Stellarium, um, one of the things that I discovered in writing these articles is that um, not every object has a, a deep sky image for it. So let's see, let me go back to, so when, you, when you're using Stellarium and you're looking at the, the Virgo cluster, this is actually, this is actually a photograph, a deep sky photograph that's been sim overlaid on top of the Stellarium simulation. So if you go down to the menu bar, I can see that there's a, beside the planets, there's a lit icon here, and I can click that and turn off the, the images. So you're just left with the simulated stars. Okay, and what that means is that somebody's had to go to the effort to add these photographs for the different objects. Let me head up in here too. I think the, yeah, here's another one here. So, so by default, those are switched on. But the, but the point I'm trying to make is that not every good galaxy has been given an image in Stellarium. So there are some good ones that if you're just sort of scanning around the sky like that, you wouldn't find them because you weren't aware. Nobody's put a picture there to show you a fuzzy patch. So you wouldn't necessarily know they're there. Now, in some cases, there are still symbols, but if you zoom in, you won't see anything because nobody's planted a picture there. So that what, what's gonna become your friend is the DSS button, the Deep Sky Survey button. And that's the one down here. So I've got beside my, um, my photos button, there's another button called DSS. And it may not be enabled in your copy of Stellarium yet. 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to set that up. And let me just give you an example of, let's see, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to an object in, the min in a minute to, to give an example of that. Uh, let's just pick, yeah. So here's an example. I just picked a random galaxy, NGC 4525. See how I can zoom in and zoom in and I don't see any picture for it. So there just hasn't been one put on. But if you go into your sky and viewing options, F, or you can hit F4 in Windows, but there's a, it's a command in um, Apple, but you can find the sky and viewing options. Um, tab over, sorry, let's get out of here for a minute. You, what you wanna do is go to configuration. Go to your configuration window. Go on over to extras and then put a check mark in the DSS survey box. The DSS survey box. I also recommend, highly recommend you enable the flip buttons as well and the nebula backgrounds. So once you've got that done, then you can head on over to main and you can save your settings to remember that, that change you've made. And when you've got that done, then it'll show up as an extra button down here in your menu. And when you click it, the software will go off to the internet and it'll download tiles, just like Google Earth will download map tiles. Stellarium will download deep sky, wide field surveys of the entire sky. And so you can actually see what every patch of sky looks like on this deep sky survey um, view. But if you're, if you're zoomed out and you're showing a lot of sky, it'll take a long time for that download to happen. So I recommend only using it when you've already zoomed in on a patch of sky. So if I, get, if I click this, give it a moment or two, it'll grow and grow and grow. And now you see there's a galaxy there. Ooh. So that's the deep sky survey image for that galaxy. Um, if I go to, then, and what you can do is if I go to say, let me just come back to my M87. I'm gonna go back to the Virgo cluster here. So you can use this instead of the pictures that are built in. And you can see that there's some flaws because people have actually um, patched together mosaics of the sky. And you do get these odd, these funny patches and these overlaps. Um, so this is the deep sky survey uh, view of M87. If I turn that off and switch back, it switches back to that lovely view that we showed at the beginning, the Virgo cluster. So that's the, D, the DSS button, highly recommend it. That's the first thing you want to do. Second thing you want to do is if you want to plan your attack is you want to simulate the view that your telescope will be seeing of the sky. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. So one is that you can, um, you need to figure out given your telescope's um, configuration, it's, it's uh, characteristics. So it's aperture, it's focal length, it's F ratio. Um, and the eyepieces you have, what's the, um, actual field of view that you're going to see through your telescope. And I like this tool. Let me just open this link up here. And I'll share this view. So this is one page I like. It's called the Naperville Astronomical Association um, Calculator. And what you can do is you can use inches or millimeters. It doesn't matter. So let's say you have a six inch Skywatcher Dobsonian or uh, Orion Dobsonian or one of them, they're all basically the same sort of um, setup. So you put the, you click six inches and click enter diameter and then go down. And if you know the focal length, you can plug that in. Or if you know the focal ratio, you can plug that in. Whichever you plug in and hit calculate, it'll fill in the other number. So I happen to know that the, um, those typical six inch Dobsonians are F, 7.9 focal ratio, and it worked out the focal length for me. Then go ahead and put in your, your IP specification and say, um, you know, a Mead Plossel, 25 or 26 millimeter Plossel, put that in. And then if you can find out your eyepiece's um, field, apparent field of view, 
and plug that in. The plaza would be around 50 degrees, something like that. And you plug that in, then down here it gives you what your telescope will show. So your telescope will actually show you a true field of about 1.1 degrees of the sky if you have a six inch Dobsonian with a 26 millimeter plossal. And you can plug in different numbers and get different, uh, different values. When I can, I'll just get into this for a second here. And so what I did is you can head into the mark, into the um, viewing options, markings, enable your circular field of view, and you could plug in 1.1 degrees. And that's the patch of sky you should see in your eyepiece for that telescope. Um, the other ones I have, I did some calculations for people. If you have an 80 millimeter refractor, uh, those are, the focal lengths vary, but if you have a, a nice wide field, a stubby one, an, an F6 or something like that, you'll get a big, almost a three degree field of view, and, you know, two and a half or plus two degree field of view. And on an eight inch or a six inch um, uh, SCT, which is about an F10 ratio, will give you a very small field of view, under a degree, maybe 0.7. And that's one of the reasons why I sold my SCT and bought a big Dobsonian is because the SCTs um, have a very narrow field of view, relatively speaking. The way you can get around it though, of course you can buy more expensive eyepieces with a wider, uh, a wider actual field of view that gives you a bigger, a wider apparent field of view that gives you a bigger uh, visible field, field of view. So most tele, most eyepieces would be, you know, in the 50 degree or 60 degree, the way they're designed. If you buy a higher end eyepiece that gives you a 68 or an 82 or a 100 degree field of view, then you can grow this circle bigger and bigger. The other way you can do it is you can use the, there's an oculars plug-in in Stellarium. I'll just turn this off and show you the other. If you go on up to the upper right corner, if you've got your oculars set up, the way you set those up is you go to configuration window, go to your plugins, look for oculars. Where are my oculars here? And then click to load at startup and you can configure. And if you go in here to configure, you can actually um, define your own telescope or, or choose from a list that's already in here. So if you have say, Oh, I'm ETX 90. This Dobsonian one that I, I created for everybody. Um, this is the typical focal length and diameter for a Dobsonian telescope. Then you can go over to your eyepieces. You could, it's got a bunch of eyepieces already in here, so you can choose from them or you can plug in your own numbers and put your own eyepiece in as well. And then when you do that and set that up, you can go on here and you can click the ocular here. Oh, it wants me to pick an object, so I'll pick M87. If I click that, then as I use these left and right arrows, I can actually run through the different telescopes. So I've got it set for the Dobsonian telescope and I've got it set for, let's go to, a, let's see, different eyepieces give me different magnifications and a different field of view. So what you can do is work through your own, this is um, binoculars. Oh, wow. You can even do binoculars. And see how it's actually giving you Northeast, South and West? So it's, yeah. it's doing that for you. So you don't need to do that, that calculation. So that's a cool trick, a cool um, tool that you can use. And when you're done, you can just turn it back off and it's done. All right, so let's, let's get into some, uh, some objects. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this off. So I designed the, uh, the article for this time of year. So I've picked the, the Moonless Night in, oh, here we are in mid-May. And I'm gonna use the Stellarium bookmarks. So I created some bookmarks. Let me just clear these bookmarks. Import, so I've created some bookmarks to show me which stars. So these are the stars and I'm gonna highlight them. So the stars that I've highlighted here all have galaxies sitting within a degree of them, okay? So let's run through uh, some, some examples. Um, now, the one in Regulus here is kind of gonna be hard for some people. What it is, let me just bring this up here. So Regulus is a bright star, so that makes, that makes it tricky. Um, the, 
the galaxies sitting next to bright stars are going to be difficult to image because the star will overwhelm your picture. But the human eye has a lot more dynamic range. So there are going to be cases where the visual will outweigh the, the photographic approach. Um, but this one in particular is going to be difficult. This is called the, let's bring it up here, Regulus or Leo 1. Let me just add some here. So, yeah, it's not even in the catalog, but can you see Regulus? There's a little dim fuzzy patch Ooh, above it. There's yeah. a loose elliptical galaxy. This is called Leo 1. And it's very, very faint since it's very distributed. So this one would probably be um, a real challenge for most people unless you've got perfect skies. Um, the other, one of the other tricks that you wanna do, of course, is you want to, once you're there, is you can try hiding the star. So let me just bring up my field of view. You can try hiding the star outside the field of view so that the galaxy is not overwhelmed by the, the bright star. Hmm. That one's called Leo one. So I'm not gonna spend much time talking about that one because it's not as good. Okay. So here, the next one that I like is NGC 3227. And that one's up near Algeba. So let's go up to Algeba. So if you aim your telescope at Algeba and put it, put it so that you've got and where's, let's look at east and west here. So we do this, we start time running. So west is to the lower right here, right? So these galaxies would be considered to be east of Algeba or opposite the drift direction. And again, you can just hide the bright star outside the field of view and zoom in and see how there's nothing shown here. But if I reveal it with my DSS, It's like, um, kind of like a mini, a mini pinwheel, a mini uh, whirlpool galaxy. So it mess, looks like Messi 51 with the main galaxy and the little satellite galaxy as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, are, these, are, these are relatively bright. They're small, but they're relatively bright. So you don't need a giant telescope to see them. I think a four inch, three or four inch telescope under, under dark skies would be fine. Um, the size you can see given the, the one degree field of view, they're not very big, but once you've got the object, then you can pop in your higher power eyepiece and magnify them. But for the purposes of searching, I'd recommend that you stick with the one degree plus field of view for those. Mm -hmm. um, you might be able to notice that one of them is spiral and the other one is elliptical. Ooh. So you can see the, the spiral arms on the one and the elliptical on the other. So if you have a good telescope, a bigger telescope, you might be able to detect the difference between them. All right, let's go back. Let's go to the next one here. I'm gonna go up to Ursa Major. So let's head up to 3893. So let's see. Just turn off, yeah, turn off this. So the one up here in Ursa Major So the star Chi Ursa Majoris, or in Stellarium, it's labeled as Taiyang Shou, which is a Chinese name, or Al Kafra, um, which is different. So if you're using uh, Sky Safari or a different app, you might not see that same name, but it's definitely Chi, which is the big capital X, Ursa Majoris. So if you zoom in on that one, I'll just bring up the galaxies nearby. So then you've got NGC 3877. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear out these highlights, clear these bookmarks. I'm going to bring in the bookmarks that go with the, uh, here we go. There we go. So as you're doing yeah. that, I will brief, briefly mention, have you got it all set up now? Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, so I, I don't, I probably do, I don't do a whole lot of either imaging or observing, but I probably do slightly more imaging um, on a large scale than I do observing. And these targets would be a nightmare to image because the light from those bright stars would really mess up the photos. 
So it's kind of neat. I don't know. It feels kind of cool to have like a little secret. I don't want to say it's a secret club, but it's basically like a little group of targets that is really only good for observing and not good for photography. Yeah. Well, and it's a cool thing to try. And it's, it's so easy just to, um, uh, just to put your wide field eyepiece in and then aim your finder scope at the star and then figuring out the rules for northeast, That's south and west, go. navigate yeah. to the star. Makes it makes going into um, star hopping and visual observing for this kind of stuff a little less daunting. Mm -hmm. um, this one's nice because it's, it's edge on, so it's going to be fairly bright in the view. Okay, now if you put, there's another one. So if you go, while you're here, the same star, and by the way, this star is the, the rear joint, the rear leg of the big bear. Okay, so here's Ursa Major. Here's the dipper. And then off Fecta, you've got the rear legs of the bear. And we're looking at the star that's the kind of bend in the joint. So that's where you can find that 3877, that little edge on spiral. And then if you, if you navigate a little bit to the other side here, you can pick up some more galaxy. This is a nice spiral, 3893. This would be magnitude 10.7 for people that are interested. I've got all this, uh, all of these facts are in the article in Sky News if anybody wants the um, particular details on its dimensions and its magnitude and so on. Um, I think I noted that this one, it's reasonably bright considering its edge on, has a, a brighter core to it, a more dense core, which will allow it to be visible. Um, it's a bit of a, another doppelganger for the Whirlpool galaxy. And a, if you have a big telescope, you might even be able to see the, you know, the more dominant spiral arms in it as well. And while you're here, look for this neat um, red star. This is the, uh, giant red star HT Ursa Majoris, which is uh, sitting nearby. So that can, that can kind of act as one of your, get your, uh, your confirmation objects to see if you can find that as well. And then there's a bunch of those. And then I think I said, if you go, if, yeah, if you're just in the area, you should be able to also find Messier 106, which is nearby. So where's Messier 106? It's in the same area. Anyway, oh yeah, there it is. So that's, that's the uh, rear joint of the bear's leg. And then let's wind back and look at the toes of the bear. So now we've got this star. Okay, I wanna look for mu, where's mu? There we go. So continue down the leg of the bear, look for the two stars that are the toes of the bear. Look for the one that's the more southerly one, and that's called Tanya or, or Mu. And again, within one degree, you've got this really nice galaxy, Ooh, NGC so pretty. 3180. Now, um, this galaxy's designation is actually NGC 3184 but Stellarium has a bug or something that calls it 3180. So um, if you're using, I, I noted that in the article so that you can, you can avoid that confusion. So that's a magnitude 10.4 galaxy. Um, that should be visible in smaller telescopes. It's quite a substantial galaxy, as you can see, okay. Um, when you're looking at this one, notice that the cord is a little bit offset. So the arms are a little bit more, extend a little bit farther out to one side. And there's a foreground star embedded in the galaxy's disc. Hmm. So you look for this extra That's star. Neat. That doesn't happen that often, does it? Um, it's just a coincidental thing that happens sometimes, yeah. All right, winding back. Let's move on. Let's go to the the hunting dogs, Canis Venatici. So this is going to be this is going to be um, a really good one for people. This is a brighter galaxy. So Canis Venatici are these two stars. The lower one is the famous double star Cor 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 Coralli. At the under end of the stick is the star Beta or Chara. Beta Canis Venatici or the or star Chara. So go on up to that. Put that in your field of view and look. 
north of it, north, so northwest of it, for the cocoon galaxy. And this is another wow. one of these irregular, I'm just gonna take the symbols off so you can see how cool it is. So oh, that's a cocoon so cool. galaxy. So these are two galaxies that are gravitationally attracting one another. So that's causing this distortion. It's um, kind of looks like a tadpole to me. Yeah. And look for, there's a dim little star near the tadpole's mouth is what I noted when I was looking at it myself. So if you have a bigger telescope, you might see some, um, some internal hint of internal structure when you're looking at this one. All right, what else have I got here? Next one I've got is, oh yes, Malat 107, the Malat 111. So when you're in, when you're in the Coma Ber Berenices region, aim your binoculars at the upper or the northwestern star and look for this great open star cluster called Malat 111 that's in that area. So not a telescope. I mean, it's okay with a telescope, but binoculars, it's even better. What's my time doing here? We have a half hour. Okay. So NGC 4448 is the next one I have on my list here. So if you look for this star, Aldefira or Gamma Coma Berenices, then you can find NGC 4448. And again, it doesn't have a Stellarium picture, but if you reveal it. So this is a barred spiral galaxy oriented east to west. Um, it's small, but see how it, it's very compact. So it might show up reasonably well in a, in a smaller telescope. And if you've got a big telescope, zoom in and notice that there's a whole bunch of galaxies around it. It's so that's also a nice imaging here. candidate. All right, let's wind back. Now we're gonna go and, and look at the maiden's toes. So go down to Virgo. So we started out at the west end of Virgo where the Virgo cluster is, but if you go down to the other end where her feet are, and find this star, which is her leg, her sort of northeasterly leg, and zoom in on that one. That's the star 109 Virginis. And this is a, a nice one for people who are just getting going. So there's 109 Virginis. Again, I'm gonna bring up the deep sky image, the DSS image, and look at this. Fantastic edge on spiral galaxy. Ooh. So this is NGC 5746. It's called the Blade and Pearl. Okay, so it's, uh, let's see, it's uh, magnitude 11.3, but it has a high surface brightness because its stars are compacted into a narrow, a narrow slash aligned roughly north-south. Um, look for, there's a bright field star just off the tip that you can look for. And if you have a bigger telescope, you can look for the, see how the central bulge is a little bit broadened. So it really yeah, looks like a UFO. Rectangle old fashioned UFO. <laughs> uh, another one I had here was in the same neighborhood, 5740, which is smaller, but it's a little spiral galaxy as well. So if you're in the neighborhood, you can look for that one as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so now 5838, where's my 5838? So if you go back, so we just turn off the DSS. So here's that 109 where we just were. And look for another naked eye star uh, a few degrees to the east or to the lower left at this time of the year. And that's um, 110 Virginis. And that one's got a whole bunch of galaxies. All of these little uh, blue labels are galaxies, of course. So we've got collectively, there's a group here called um, the, where is it here? There's a group, yep. Yeah. So we've got this one. So if you can get 110 Virginis in your field of view, you can slew to the right and again, bring up the DSS image. You can bring up NGC 5813. 
And again, I'm going to turn off the stars. That's a that's an elliptical. The little thing out. below it is so cute. The little NGC five eight one four. Yeah. Oh, so cute. Almost looked like a, a ring. See how it's. Uh... Yeah, that's so cool. So if anybody images any of these, you know, do let us know and share them with us. I guess. Yeah. If any of you, I, I assume, actually, I haven't talked about this to most of the public, but one of my favorite things is tiny galaxies. Um, and I realize that they're not actually tiny. They're just far away. But finding tiny galaxies in photos is like my biggest joy. I don't know why. I just think it's great. Yeah. So when you're at, when you've put, um, when you've got um, 110 Virginis in your field of view, um, swing it up to the upper right or kind of westerly corner here. And then the region down below it is full of galaxies. So this is called the, um, the NGC 5846 group. So there's, it's dominated by one called NGC 5846, but there's a number around it as well. And here, here's another one of those neat barred spiral with a ring around it. That's really cool, 5850. Now 58, let's see, 5846, yeah, 5838, where's 5838? So there's one here, 5838, there's uh, 5846 and 5850, those three, those are part of David Levy's uh, Deep Sky Gems. Those are on page uh, 324 of the Observer's Handbook. So just like Alan Dyer did his finest NGC objects, then David Levy has his own recommended set of objects that are that are maybe a little more challenging, but but fun to go after. Those, that's the Deep Sky, oh no, that's the Deep Sky Gem cert certificate program, eh? Uh, yes, I think you can get one for that as well, yeah. Perfect, I'll okay. send that in the chat. 13, where's my 5813? Yeah, so go back to um, 110 Virginis, and as I said, you can look for this group of galaxies that are sitting just off to the west of NGC 110. Okay. All right. So the next one, this is kind of a this is kind of a fun one that I found, and it won't be that easy to every for everybody. But we've got the really bright constellation, really bright star Arcturus, which is up here in the sort of southeastern sky on uh, May evenings, and the kite shaped constellation extends to the northeast from there, up towards the tip of the handle of the Big Dipper. And if you aim, say, binoculars or something up near the star Alcade, where we started out near Messier 101, you can find these three stars that form a narrow triangle. These are called uh, Acellus, Tertius, Secundus, and Primus. I think those are, I think those are the donkeys. Yeah, those are the donkey stars. Wow. And just below them, so just a little bit So near them. So start with the, little, the triangle of the donkeys and then turn your gaze a little bit to the lower right or the southwest and look for a pair of dimmer stars. So that's magnitude five and a half and magnitude 5.7. So there's similar brightness. And if you aim your telescope between those, there are actually a pair of galaxies right on the line between them. And again, you need to turn on your DSS tab here. And there's actually, a, there are actually four galaxies in this little group that are sitting kind of right tucked between those two, um, that pair of faint naked eye stars. So these ones I noted were relatively high surface brightness, um, just because they're kind of oblique. And then you've got for, you know, for an extra bit of an extra challenge, try to get these two little narrow slashes, these two little edge on galaxies as well. So that's 5660, 5676. All right, so the one that I think is really fun that we're gonna end up with here, heading back into the, the Eastern sky, is one that people may already have seen before and that's right beside Messier 13, the globular cluster. Let me turn off the symbol here. 
there's a little spiral galaxy called NGC 6207. And so the white circle is one degree field of view, don't forget. So M13 fills up a good 25% of your field of view. And then just sitting off to the northeast or north northeast of the globular cluster is a little galaxy. And I'll just turn on the deep sky image here. And I'm going to turn off the stars. Oops. Turn off the stars. There we go. So there's a simulated view. It's kind of a, a little teeny galaxy, but it's bright because it's compact. And I've definitely seen that. Um, you just need to be aware that it's there and, and pay attention and take a look beside, uh, beside M13. And one last just to finish off. Kind of the point is, the point here is to, when you're looking at something, as you said, notice around it, see if there's anything else yeah. in the same time. So um, most people know that if you go to Lyra and you aim your telescope midway between the two stars at the bottom of the rectangle, that's where the ring nebula lives. So there's the ring nebula right there. And I'll bring up the deep sky image. Bring this up. And I don't know if you can see on the broadcast, but there's a little loose spiral galaxy sitting right beside the ring nebula, a faint one. It's so tiny. So next time you're looking at the ring nebula, see if you can see NGC or IC1296. So tiny. At the same time. Um, I'll just bring up one more that's not visible right now, and that's the star Mirac. So let's find Mirac. This is one of the most famous examples of these. So Mirac will become visible late summer. So here's the square of Pegasus. Here's Andromeda. Here's Almac, which is a really nice double star. Here's M M31 above it. But if you go down to Mirac, which we almost always use to find M31, and zoom mm. in on that, there's a galaxy sitting right beside it. Whoa. And this is called Mirac's ghost. It's it's going to be hard, right, because of that bright star, oh. but but it's there. Cool. It does look like a ghost. So anyway, those are some ways that you can use naked eye stars to find some other objects. If you want to do more of this uh, kind of hunting for yourself, so let me just set this back to today. You know, you can just do things like use Stellarium to bring up the labels for the Messiers. Let's just do the Messiers for now. And then just look around and see if any of them, you know, are any of them, any of the Messiers near any bright stars that you can use to navigate around. I've kind of already gone through most of the key examples. So there's the one we talked about near your effecta uh, and that kind of thing. So, just hopefully, it's opened up some opportunity for people that don't have go to telescopes that can uh, can find some of these objects. Yeah, and you can always grab your copy of Sky News and put through there for more details, that sort of stuff. Alandria mm -hmm. has been in the chat, and she sent out the link to the online version as well. This will yeah, certainly yeah, so help when it comes to observing. Yeah, not every not every uh, set of objects were could fit in the magazine, so we did an online supplement. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of lot of information out there, all from Chris. It's great information. <laughs> um, so throughout this chat, I think we have quite a few new folks here. So welcome to the new folks who are here. Just mm -hmm. to let you know, we do stream these on YouTube. So if at any point you want to rewatch something or you want to go back and go over what we talked about, or maybe you can't observe tonight and you've completely forgotten everything that we talked about in the past hour and a half, which is 100% fair um, and is what I do on a regular basis, then you can go on to our YouTube channel and rewatch it anytime there. Um, so if you want a trick, someone in the chat was talking about setting up DSS or whatever again, the dark sky or the deep sky survey, um, go back to YouTube, you can rewatch it there. We have lots of other videos up there too. Um, about how to use Stellarium and that sort of stuff. 
Um, and so if you are interested in learning more about using Stellarium, um, that's all available online. Uh, there was one question from Marion, which is um, not related to finding galaxies necessarily near stars, but if you're out looking for comets, do you, Chris, prefer an SCT or a Dobsonian telescope? Oh, well, um, I'd rather be searching with a Dobsonian than an SCT. But again, that's why I sold my SCT <laughs> is because uh, I found the, the field of view rather narrow. I mean, they're great, they're great all-purpose telescopes because they'll magnify planets nicely, right? Mm -hmm. um, usually when you lose field of view, you gain on magnification. So they're, they're great for planets. So they're more general purpose. But if you want to be hunting for the best of the deep sky, then the Dobsonians are great because their focal ratios are smaller and you can see a bigger patch of sky. So for me, if I'm looking for a comet, I'd rather have my Dobsonian. And here's a, here's a tip for people that have go-to telescopes that worry that when a, new when a new comet appears that it's not in the database. Don't forget that the sky is loaded with 12 or 15,000 deep sky objects. And most of those, if not all of them, are in your computer's go-to database. So just find out what deep sky objects the comet will be happen to be passing that night and search for that in your go-to telescope using a wide field eyepiece and it'll take you to the comet, basically. Yeah. That's very clever. So that's what Good I, that's point. a trick I use all the time. Good call, good call. Or, a, or a star, you know, you can use the stars, a minor stars, uh, HD, Henry Draper designation, or it's SAO number or something. You just need a chart that shows you where the comet is going to be. So often um, you'll use a Stellarium Mobile or a Sky Safari that'll show you the comet's location and just see what it's passing close to and then go to that. Um, thank you for your, your advice. Uh, if you have other questions about generally buying telescopes and stuff like that, you can check the um, Q&A answered section um, for information about that telescope stuff, which I will just quickly copy and paste into um, the chat as well, just in case there's anyone who's interested. There we go. Um, we have a couple episodes from the Insider's Guide to the Galaxy, and then there's also a video there, a shorter one from Tim Yaworski, Living Sky Guy from the Paris of the Prairies. In, uh, in Saskatoon. So he's got a video on our channel as well about it. Okay, I think that's, is that all we have, Chris, for today? Well, if nobody has any questions, I've got a bonus item for you. <gasps> oh, bonus items. Yes, please, bonus items. <laughs> so you've all heard in the news about the rocket that, that crashed in the Indian Ocean, we think, the yeah. other day. Um, and that rocket launched the first section of China's new space station. It's called... Uh, it's called Tianhe, I think it's called. Let's see if I can find it here. D, 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 D. Thought I had it on here. Uh, did I? Maybe I didn't. No, I didn't have it. Okay, I thought I did. Let me see if I can find it here. So the Tianhe space station will be visible from Canada in evening this week. And I'll find it. I'll find a case for us to look at. Okay, so for me in my area, it's going to be passing. Let's see what's a good one. May 16th. Let me just bring up May 16th. Right, okay, just so just for clarification, this is looking at the space station and not the rocket that has fallen into the Indian Ocean. Uh, yeah, the, the rocket's rocket gone, but the, station's, the space station's okay. still in orbit. So if you go to Heavens Above and put in your coordinates in the location here, then you can, there's a tab for looking for the Tianhe one passes. You want to look for passes that are low, low numbers, which are the brighter ones, and ideally the highest point be a nice high number. So if you say pick this one on May 16th at 22-21-51, so I'm going to set mine to May 16th at 22-21-51, and you need to enable satellites in your Sky Safari. And let's see. Have you, this is, uh, this is Stellarium, but have you updated your Stellarium to have the, the, the satellite or well, the satellite, the space station in it? It, it, um, I don't think I need to do anything special. I think it had it oh, in cool. there. Yeah, I think it did Sweet. an update. Um, I'm just going to turn my landscape to zero just to make it very obvious. So let's see, oh, facing the wrong way. Let's see if I can find it. So. 
I should be able to find it here. One, two, three. Let's see. TM. Tianha. There we go. Oh, cool. So it doesn't get very high for us in Canada, but it um, cool. has a lower inclination orbit. But Very neat. There it is. <laughs> so if you're curious what all the fuss is about, you can use uh, Heavens Above and Stellarium to, to, to track it down. Very cool, very cool. So this is a magnitude, uh, magnitude plus 1.2, so it'll be definitely naked eye, relatively, mm -hmm. relatively bright. And it'll take, awesome. yeah, a couple minutes. So that's, that's it. We've Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, this was yet again great to, thank you so much for all the information. I've contributed almost nothing to this talk besides the questions that, <laughs> that I have and the failures that I have. I really appreciate you sharing all of this knowledge with us. Um, and I believe next time we're going to be talking about the long awaited solar eclipse that's coming up in June, on June 10th. Um, and we'll be talking about how to uh, safely observe the sun Pro tip, don't look right at it um, unless you have the right equipment and join us in two weeks to figure out how to do that. I think that's it for us, eh, Chris? That's great, yeah. Well, I've got some ideas for some, some, some safe things that you can make at home to project the sun, pinhole cameras and things like that. But if you, um, you know, we have an eclipse coming up. So if you can get a hold of eclipse glasses and get up early, set the alarm and hope for clear skies. Yes, I will also mention that Eclipse glasses, um, they're not quite glasses, it's like a little sheet with solar filters in it. Those are available online at skynews.ca in their store. Um, buy them soon if you would like them to arrive at your house before um, the actual solar eclipse. Um, so the link is in the chat. I will also throw it in the YouTube description. Um, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. If you're looking for something else to do tonight, uh, the Helen Sawyer Hogg lecture put on put on by Casca is streaming on our YouTube channel as well. Um, that'll be starting at 7.30. If you would like to join, that is RAS Canada. Um, and we will all be there to hang out and chat as well. And by we all, I mean, at least me, maybe Chris, I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping to see it, yeah. Fingers crossed. All right, we'll see you all in two weeks. Take care, everybody. <laughs>